All right. Well, thank you for attending our final session. Um, so today is going to be some review, reflection back, and then implications on missions. Uh, I think this is the most important one because it's really kind of bringing it all together. It's really the, the so what do we do now class. Like we've learned stuff. That's great. So what? What do we do now? So that's kind of the point of the class, reviewing what we did. Now what do we do as a church? So uh, let's pray and then we'll get to it. Lord, Father in heaven, we thank you for another evening to come and think about how we can love you through loving our neighbors and how by loving our neighbors, we continue the mission that you have for this world to bring it closer to its fulfillment through the work of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so a little review before we get started. So I wanted to kind of go back through our class sessions. So why engage other religions, right? So what was the point of doing all this? So we kind of had three, three reasons about why it was important to engage other religions. And the reason I'm reviewing all of these slides is because all of these slides are pertinent and all our classes are pertinent into how we think about missions at the end. So I want to kind of reiterate the, the highlights and the points. So when I get to missions at the end, you can kind of see the connection, the through line for the class. Yes, there is a method to my madness. It's a reason why I said the things I said. So first, recognizing our context, right? We are living in a postmodernist world. I was even in a, a discussion with some colleagues today. Uh, we have a coffee time at 10.30 to 11.15 with the Bible theology faculty. And we were talking together. And we were talking about how... So we have a class called um, Biblical Criticism. So it's understanding how scholars critique the Bible. And we we're commenting on how, like... In the early 2000s and in the 90s, this class was mostly about whether or not the Bible was true or not. But students aren't interested in that anymore. Students want to know about the morality and ethical questions of the Bible. So it's kind of shifted. And I thought this was interesting because that's emblematic of a, the postmodern turn. So the postmodernist question is not, is it true? The question is, does it work? Is it good? So it's a moral ethical question, not a true or false question. The modernist question is a true or false question. So we now live in a, is it good? Is it true? Does it work? Context. So kind of rethinking the questions and how we approach our faith and practices. Second, it rem reminding ourselves of what God has done in scripture by engaging the perceived religious other, whether it's Melchizedek coming and blessing Abraham, whether it's Christ engaging with the centurion, uh, whether it's the prophets going out and so the prophet Jonah going out and preaching to the people of Nineveh. So God has always had a, an eye and a heart for those who are outside the explicit covenant community. Um, and finally, rethinking our understanding of grace, that grace is perva pervasive. Grace is expansive throughout the world. It is not something that we contain, but God is working throughout all of creation by God's grace externally and internally in order to bring humanity and bring all of creation back to God's self. So these are kind of the, the three warrants of why go out and engage other traditions. And then we talked about the kind of three responses one could have to the question of who is saved. So the question of salvation. The exclusivist one, which says only those who explicitly say they're followers of Jesus Christ and are in the church are saved. The inclusivist position who, said, who would say people are saved through Jesus Christ, although they may not know it or acknowledge it. And then the pluralist position, which would say all religions are equal vehicles of salvation. But then we also examine another question, which is not the question of who's in or out with regards to salvation, but the question of how can we learn about God amongst religious diversity? So the question of where can we find truth and knowledge? So the first one is, where do we find salvation? The second one asks the question, where do we find truth and knowledge? It kind of tables the salvation question. This is where we talked about having a faith that seeks understanding through or with another religious tradition. And so this was kind of the, the path we walked on as we engaged the Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist traditions. Right? 
So we would start with a question from our tradition. We would kind of see what Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists would think. And then we would end with some reflections on our own tradition. And so I want to go back over some of our conclusionary reflections that we had from each of these traditions through this path. So for the Muslim tradition, we talked about the importance of prayer. We talked about how in Islam, there are the five pillars of Islam. One of them is prayer, praying five times a day. And how this is something that is very formative. Praying and actually doing actions, habituating oneself, does in fact and can change the way a person thinks and the way a person acts. And so there's something beautiful that Christians can learn about being very open and honest about our prayer lives. Being willing to pray in public, being willing to pray multiple times a day, being reminded to pray multiple times a day. And even having liturgical prayer is something that can benefit us. So not... Not all prayer needs to be spontaneous. So having liturgical prayer, especially as we enter in the season of Lent coming up, can be something that's beneficial for our spiritual lives. Also, the importance of our sacred text. So the Quran is very important for the Muslim tradition, as I was discussing earlier. Even for Muslims who don't understand the language of the text, just the power of hearing the Quran for them has ethical transformative meaning. And so what does it mean for us to be transformed by the hearing of scriptures? Sometimes when we read the scriptures in church, I will intentionally not read the text, but listen to it and try to imagine how this text would have been heard by its original hearers. It was a letter that was read out loud to a community. And this is how the letter was intended to be received as a heard or oral letter. And so what would that look like as a practice to kind of contemplate what does it mean to listen to the word being spoken and not simply just reading it on a text, right? Kind of the communal listening as opposed to the individual reading. And then the importance of tradition and community. Uh, we're also, uh, the, it's going to be the uh, month of Ramadan soon as well for the Muslim community. And this is a time of gathering and hospitality. Um, many of my Muslim friends will call other male and female Muslims, brothers and sisters. So well, my Muslim friend, he's male. He'll, when he meets another Muslim male, he'll say brother so-and-so. He meets a, a, a woman, he'll say sister so-and-so. So everybody's brother and sister. And so it's this interesting kind of communal family understanding. And I think this is something beautiful, especially in a society in which we live in, that can be highly individualistic. People can feel very lonely and very isolated. And so really creating this community of meaning and belonging is something very beautiful and something the church is called to do as well. So from the Hindu tradition, we thought about the diversity of the Hindu tradition or the inability for us to even talk about the Hindu tradition. There is no one singular Hindu tradition. There are many, many different Hindu traditions. And so it causes, it should prompt us to be humble in light of our trying to understand another religious tradition and practice. To really be open to receiving what another person tells us about what their faith and practice means to them before making a judgment about how we understand the faith and practice. So it's, a, it's an exercise of intellectual humility in the face of a tradition that is thousands of years older than our tradition and much more complex. And that should also help us appreciate our own diversity. So when we, we can't talk about a singular Hindu tradition, so too we can't talk about a singular Christian tradition. There is no singular Christian denomination that holds the end-all, be-all of the interpretation of what it means to be a Christian. But there are many different denominations, and all of them are struggling about what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And they have different understandings of what that means. And so being able to look at someone from a Catholic tradition or an Orthodox tradition, a Coptic tradition, a Pentecostal tradition, um, or a more conservative or liberal tradition, and say, we are all brothers and sisters trying to understand what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And being open to learning and engaging without feeling the need to say, you must join me or I have to join you. I am happy and fine where I am, and this is where we are. And it is, is okay also for my brother and sister over there to be seeking Jesus through their church. And so being open to the intra-Christian diversity that we have. And in this sense, there's a certain cohesion that we have, even within this seeming plurality of denominations. There is still a cohesion underneath it because it's still the church. It's still people striving to follow Jesus. And in that sense, we are all brothers and sisters. And that's something I think the Hindu tradition can help us appreciate. 
And finally, appreciating our own history of the development of our tradition. Namely, the law of prayer is the law of faith. Lex orandi, lex credendi. The reason why we Christians believe certain things is because Christians first practiced it and then reflected upon it. We believe Jesus Christ is Lord because for hundreds of years, Jesus prayed to Jesus Christ as Lord. And then in the fourth century, we got the Nicene Creed to solidify and kind of put into quote-unquote metaphorical stone what we mean when we say Jesus Christ is Lord. But that was a couple hundred years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so being more open and okay with the practice of faith amidst intellectual uncertainties. We practice and then we reflect. And it is the, in our, even in our tradition, the, our historical tradition, the practice preceded the reflection. Now the Buddhist tradition, there are quite a few things from this. So we talked about suffering. What does it mean to talk about suffering, particularly in the concept of dukkha? So the concept of dukkha is suffering not as a physical pain, but suffering as a sense of I'm trying to attain something or I have a desire and I don't get what I desire. And so understanding Christ's suffering on the cross as dukkha actually expands and makes that suffering even more universal. It's not simply a physical pain. It's not simply, it's not simply the concept of misery. It's this holistic human longing that we have for God, but because of our fallenness and sin, we cannot reach the longing of our hearts. And that is what Christ took on. This kind of larger understanding of what suffering means. And I think that also can help alleviate Christians who live in a wealthier, more established, industrialized society in that we see that we are also subject to dukkha, a type of suffering that perhaps for us is even harder to recognize because we have so much wealth. We attain many things that we desire, and therefore we actually desire more. We desire more because we get more of what we want. And so actually, we suffer more dukkha, perhaps. And this is a, a good cautionary tale for us to re-examine our lives, again, with the season of Lent coming up. And what does it mean to give up? What does it mean to strip ourselves of our desires? And this is a helpful thought practice, I think, for this upcoming season. And then from the Buddhist practice, the idea of meditation. Again, something in the way that God has created the body and the mind and breath in that they are connected all together. And so the Buddhist practice of meditation has created many benefits for Christians, not just today, but over the centuries, Christians have practiced breathing exercises. And not only to settle our own hearts or our own anxiety, but in order to still the mind and the soul to better contemplate God. And so when talking about prayer in the Muslim tradition, this idea of meditative prayer is something that is very prominent, particularly in monastic traditions, but also the Catholic traditions. So the idea of just repeating a simple phrase over and over. I would, uh, there was a season in my life where I would meditate through the Lord's Prayer. So every time I breathed in and out, I would say one of the words of the Lord's Prayer and allow my mind to meditate on that word. And so every breath in, first breath, hour, out, I would think about hour. Next breath in, Father, breath out, Father, and so on and so forth as I go through the prayer as a type of meditative practice. And finally, the idea of the koan, the koan as an exercise to stimulate the mind through confusion in order to help one realize that our intellectual capacities are not sufficient to contain God. God is beyond our intellect, which is great because if God was within my intellect, then God would be very small. So it is a good thing that God is beyond my mental capacities. And for us to re realize that, particularly as people who are highly educated, we tend to, again, because we are highly educated, things, we, can, we tend to understand things quite well. And we assume that what we put our minds to, we will eventually be able to understand. But glory be to God that God is inexhaustible in our intellectual capacities. And that is a good thing. So, what does this all mean for missions? We'll kind of bring it to conclusion here. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of biblical passages. I'm going to read them. And I'm going to kind of comment on them. And I've chosen each one of these because I wanted to illustrate two things. So, one, I want to illustrate God is a missional God, both in the Old and New Testament. 
So the mission of God is not something that happens in the New Testament. It's been there from the very beginning, and it's continued all the way through the New Testament, even through today. So first. And then second, I've chosen these because I want to highlight particular themes each one of these passion, passages gives us with regards to the concept of missions. So. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, you will be called blessed. So this is perhaps one of the first missional statements. And a couple of things are happening here. God is choosing a figure, Abram. From our perspective, we do not know what Abram did to be chosen. But from the biblical narrative, he did nothing to be chosen. He simply existed. And so God elected Abram to be unique amongst the peoples to do what? To go on a mission. And what was the mission? To go to the land that God will show him. Why? To bless others. So that he will be blessed, and by being blessed, he will bless others. So the inauguration of God's mission starts with the election of a particular person to go and establish a land of blessing in order to bless other people. So the mission is election to promote blessing with the goal of blessing others. That is the mission. In Psalm 96, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all, uh, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord, may I can't read that. But the more Lord made the heavens, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. This is also a missional statement. Because what is this singer telling us to do? To praise God amongst the peoples. To tell of God's glory and blessing to the peoples of the nations. Why? Because the things that they are worshiping, the, I, are the gods, small g gods, are in fact not gods at all. They do not exist. There is one true God who is worthy of worship and blessing, who seeks and desires to bless them. And so what do the people of God do? Praise God to other people. So this is hand in hand with Abram's mission. Abram's mission is to establish a place that will be blessed to bless others. And how do people bless others? By praising God amongst the nations. Telling them of the glorious things of God. His strength and his beauty, his honor and his majesty. Because he is to be revered above all. So Matthew 24. Then they will hand you over to be tortured and will put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. I chose this because it has this very interesting turn of phrase. So it starts with this narrative, right, that there is going to be, that the apostles will be handed over. They will be tortured. They will be put to death. They will be hated. They will be despised. And this is the gospel. So Jesus said, this is the gospel. The gospel is that the apostles will do what Psalm 96 says. Go to the nations and praise what God has done. But they will be rebuked, they will be tortured, and that is the gospel. The gospel is faithfulness to the mission of God. 
the apostles' faithful mission, which was the original mission, which was to be a people who are blessed to bless others, even if they themselves are not blessed back. Because in the charge to Abram, God does not tell Abram, those who curse you seek revenge. He doesn't say that. Those who curse you, I will curse them. It is God who will defend Abram. It is God who will mete out justice for on, and on behalf of his people. It is not his people's job to meet justice out for their own sake. It's God's job. It is his people's job to be faithful to the call of blessing and proclaiming God and God's kingdom. And that is the gospel message. And then, of course, we have the, quote, Great Commission. Right. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now notice here we have a first instance of the Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi. They saw him and worshipped him. Did they have the Nicene Creed? No, they did not. <laughs> they did not have the Nicene Creed. But what are the, what, what are the apostles doing? They are worshipping Jesus Christ. Not because they're polytheists, but because they see him as God. God incarnate. They recognize this divine gospel of the good news of what Jesus has done for the world. And so what does Jesus charge them to do? Go and make other proclaimers of the gospel. Make disciples. Make followers of Jesus. Go make followers of the gospel. And baptizing them into a community in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That the baptism will be a sign and symbol of entrance into this missional community. And as a member of the missional community, they are now charged with Psalm 96 to go and proclaim and praise God to the nations. In this new and more beautiful way that Christ has given to them. And so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so here we have the charge that Jesus is telling his disciples, I am not bringing the kingdom now. This is not something for you to worry about. It is not our job to worry about when the kingdom of God is going to come or to be able to point out and say it has come. Rather, Jesus is reminding the apostles their job as the followers of Jesus is to proclaim the gospel message by, and make disciples who also proclaim the gospel message. It is faithfulness not kingdom building. The kingdom building God does. God does the kingdom building. The apostles are faithful to proclaiming the gospel through which God does the kingdom building. But we do not get to declare or decide this is the kingdom. This is how it looks. This is the measurement. This is exactly how it is going to function. That is not our decision to make. And so the guarantor of this is the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and the tongues rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now, imagine the apostles, right? So the apostles had seen their Lord crucified, raised, which was good, but then ascended to heaven. So Christ is not physically there with them anymore. They are, for most intent, all intents and purposes, alone. They are still afraid of the Roman authorities who had just crucified their leader. And so the day before Pentecost, the apostles are a persecuted group of people. The day after Pentecost... 
The apostles are still a persecuted people. Nothing exterior to the, to the apostles' lives has changed. Their context has not changed. What changed was the Holy Spirit came upon them and equipped them with a new vision of what the world could be, which is the mission of the kingdom of God, which they go and proclaim loudly in the streets. And it is God who enables them to proclaim it in the cultures and tongues and religious languages of the peoples around them. It is a transformation of their hearts and minds to imagine a different kind of world. Because the world didn't change. They changed. And it is the power of the Spirit that enables this missionary mindset. A mindset that sees a different alternative possibility to a context that seems bleak. And finally, 1 Peter 2 but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so from here in Peter, we see kind of this full circle of the call to Abram. What did God do in the call to Abram? God elected Abram to be particularly special for God's purposes. And what is God doing with the church? God has elected the church to be God's witnesses, to proclaim the praises of God, Psalm 96, to proclaim the praises of God into the nations who, though they reject the gospel message, the darkness or the treatment mentioned in Matthew, Though they might reject it, the call is faithfulness. Because they are a people who have been blessed so that they can bless. They are a people who have received mercy, right? They, that we have received mercy so that we can share this mercy with others. So I kind of want to bring all of these kind of messages that we've looked at in Scripture together into kind of a more holistic, missiological mindset or vision to kind of end us here for today. So what does it mean to be a chosen people? So in Reformed theology, we have the doctrine of election. It's in Reformed theology. But it can mean different things. And so following the, the lead of Leslie Newbegin, uh, who is a very well-beloved miss missiologist by myself and the pastors here, um, Leslie Newbegin interprets the doctrine of election not as election to necessarily be saved, but rather election in the larger scriptural perspective, as I had just laid out. Being elected to be God's people, to be charged with God's mission. Abram was elected. Abram's descendants were elected. But if you read through the Hebrew Bible, the people of Israel messed up a lot. And they got kicked out of the land. And they were sent into exile. And many of them, there was always a remnant, but many of them were condemned. They were still, the ones who were condemned and the ones who were the remnant were both part of the, quote, chosen group. So just because you're elected to be part of the chosen group doesn't mean you get it right. So what does election mean for the church? To be elected means to be chosen to be a participant in God's mission. And it is our responsibility to be faithful to the call we have received from God. That God has chosen a group of people to follow his son. To be the missionaries to the world. Whether it is in the school classroom, whether it is in a medical office, whether it is at home at the table, all of these are areas of mission, of witnessing to what God has done in the world. And so it's not simply chosen for the basis of salvation. It's chosen to be partners in the mission of God. 
And so this is going back to our definition of the Christian tradition. What does it mean when we talk about the Christian tradition? It's the tradition that is uniquely charged with communicating the gospel from one generation to the next. And what is communicating the gospel but missions? My, me teaching, me and my wife teaching our children to be followers of Jesus is a missional practice. It is an attempt to continue the Christian tradition by proclaiming the praises of God to our children. That is a missional practice. So it's not simply a very kind of, yeah, it's not simply going out and converting people. <laughs> Missions is the continuation of the gospel message from one generation to the next. That is one important aspect of missions. But another one is trying to understand what is the role of the church within the holistic vision of God's mission. And so we used to have a mission paradigm that saw the world as darkness and the church was the light. And we see this. So St. Augustine has the image of the church is the lighthouse that shines out into the dangerous oceans and allows the ships in the turbulent waters to, enable, to come home to safe harbor. Or his other metaphor is the church is the hospital that brings the wounded sick sinner and resuscitates them back to health. And these are helpful. That this, it's not that these are necessarily wrong. But what the missional practice that comes out of that is the idea that the world out there is devoid of God and therefore we need to plant a church there to bring God there. And so this was part of this old 17th, 18th, 19th century, even early 20th century paradigm of church planting, which again, it's not bad to plant churches, but it's a limited vision of what God is doing in the world. It's the idea that there is darkness, right? This idea like there be monsters. There is darkness, here is light. In order to push out the darkness, we have to plant a church. The problem is the people who plant churches tend to reciprocate our own culture and our own tradition. And it tends to not speak to the cultural diversity of the people of the countries that the missionaries are trying to serve. Now, there are many missionaries who did a very good job. I'm not saying that this was... A total failure. However, currently, the way in which missionaries and missiologists are thinking about what does missions mean, we think about it not as church planting, but we call it the wall-less church, the church without walls. Rather, we look at the world as the theater of God's glory. This comes from Calvin. Calvin calls creation the theater of God's glory. And so we talk about Missio Dei, or the mission of God, that God is a missional God. The God of the scriptures from beginning to end is a missional God. From, I mean, and I could, we could start with Adam. From Adam to Revelation, God is a missional God. And God has not ceased to be a missional God. So the role of the church is not to bring God where God is not. The role of the church is to go out where God is already working to proclaim the gospel to fulfill what God is doing in the world. So that when we meet people of other religious traditions, when we meet people who are atheists, right? They're not even a, they're not, there are maybe the category of religious nuns, right? Agnostics. That we can look and affirm what God is doing in that person's life, in that person's tradition, and say yes and let me tell you about the praises of God. So this is what we call mission with the people, as opposed to mission to the people. That missionaries now proclaim God's glory with other people. Not at them, but with them. Encouraging them and inviting them into the community of the followers of Jesus so that we could praise God together. So I call this, I'm riffing off, there's a term by John Inasu called confident pluralism. I'm riffing off of it, I'm calling it confident in pluralism. So there's a confidence part and the pluralist part. 
And I think the confidence part is particularly important. It's important for Christians to maintain our identity as uniquely different than other traditions or other people groups. For two reasons. One, it honors other people groups. It would be dishonoring to my Muslim or Hindu friend to tell them they believe the same thing as I do. Because I'm not, I'm not acknowledging the uniqueness of the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or the cosmology of the Trimurti. Those are unique concepts within those traditions. And I want to honor that they have those beliefs. But to do that, I also acknowledge that I have different beliefs. And those beliefs and practices are going to be different. And that is okay. Why? Because the Christian tradition is the one that is uniquely charged with the gospel. The Muslim tradition is not charged with the gospel. The Hindu tradition is not charged with the gospel. Neither is a Taoist or Buddhist or any tradition. We are the uniquely chosen people charged with the glorious work of proclaiming the gospel. And that is unique. And we must be confident in being different. In or, when, I have a con when you have a conversation with somebody, so I'm talking to my friend, I am not my friend, my friend is not me. There are certain things that make me me, and my friend my friend. If there were not, then we would collapse into one person. Now, let's say I talk to another friend. So I have a male friend and a female friend. And my male friend uh, likes to play board games, and my female friend likes to play sports. I like board games, and I like sports. But when I talk to my different friends, different aspects of my identity are going to come out of me. I talk to my male friend who likes board games. I'm probably not going to talk about the sports as much. And also, I'm not going to think of the fact that we have a different gender. I talk to my female friend, or I have also a very good friend who's trans. I talk to, talk to him. There are different aspects of my identity that are going to be drawn out. I did not change. But my, in conversations with other people... Right? This, this, this identity that I have gets manifested in different ways. Although I am still the same person. The reason I relate to this story is the second part of the confident and pluralism. That yes, we have a confidence in the gospel. But our confidence in the gospel does not mean we are limited to one way of discussing or thinking about or practicing this gospel message. It may come out differently with different people that you talk to. So if you're talking to a Hindu... Well, then we maybe will think about the reflections we had about the Hindu tradition. If we're talking with the Buddhists, we may think about the reflections we had of the Buddhist tradition. Or someone from the Jewish tradition or the Muslim tradition. We can be confident in the uniqueness of the Christian message while also open to being changed by our partners, by the people we are talking with. Just because I'm talking with my Muslim friend doesn't mean I change my commitment to the, my gospel beliefs, but I will think about and talk about them differently than I do with my Buddhist friends. Though I maintain my, still my commitments to the gospel. But I will think about it and talk about it a little different than my Buddhist friend. Why? Because my Buddhist friend has different commitments than my Muslim friend. And so it's this, we call it dialogue. It's this dialogue between us, who we believe are the carriers of the gospel message, and the people of the world with whom we want to partner to share this gospel message, to encourage the grace of God that we see working in other religious traditions and in people that we perceive as different than us. And so this is kind of my positing of what does it mean to be confident in the gospel, in the gospel message, but open to the pluralism that we see today. And so this is essentially the summary of the title of the class, right? What does it mean to love God, right? Be confident in our love of God. But at the same time, engage with the religious diversity of our communities. How can we be confident amidst pluralism? So that is it. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to our questions and discussions.